Hey everybody, welcome to the What Is Money show. I am thrilled to be sitting down today with author David Eagleman, uh, who's also a neuroscientist at Stanford and a New York Times bestselling author, I should mention, of eight books, including The Brain. Uh, the book The Brain is the one Preston Pish and I did a long form series on. So very excited to be speaking with you today, David, about that. Uh, welcome to the show. Great. Great to be here. Thanks for coming on and doing this. Um, what I thought we'd do is just, I've highlighted a few excerpts from your book that I really liked that I thought could um, spark some conversation. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read an excerpt. Great. You wrote that in a sense, the process of becoming who you are is defined by carving back the possibilities that were already present. You become who you are, not because of what grows in your brain, but because of what is removed. Very interesting. So we, does that mean we come with some presets that then get carved back by nurture, something like that? Sort of. So, so great. What happens is um, I said that statement in reference to the fact that when you start off life, you've got all the neurons that you're going to have. In fact, you have slightly more than you're going to have later, but they're not very well connected. So neurons are the cells of the brain and they um, communicate with each other, but they're not very densely connected. And what happens is they become more and more densely connected like an overgrown jungle during your first two years. And then after that, everything is about um, trimming things back. Hmm. And so what I meant is, you know, you've got this network that's full of all these ways that signals could go, but depending on your environment, your culture, and your family, you're going to get refined to exactly who you are. So, you know, if you were born in a different country, you would speak a different language. And that's because all of those pathways are available in your brain. It's not hard for your brain to learn a different language, but you happened to learn how to speak American English and that's what you know. And you were born in, you know, this time frame, And so you happen to think cars and phones and televisions are totally normal. But had you been born a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, you would have been carved differently by your experience so that other things were normal. And so what is left in your brain uh, is essentially a mirror of the environment around you. Mm, very interesting. Uh, this sort of segues into my next question, but uh, have you heard of material engagement theory? I don't think I have. Um, it's, I think it's cognitive archaeology, something in that field, but they basically um, posit that the external environment is a reflection of the mind. So it's. Um, ah, yeah, I don't, I don't buy that. For, for one second. I mean, I, what, what's clear is that the mind is a reflection of the, of the outside world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm sorry. I interrupted though. You were going to say, you were going to well, say something more about that's that. That's my question. Just, is there feedback between the two at all? Because as you're describing, if we're born into a different culture, different time, different technology, it shapes us differently. And then I, Yes. Assume we're also shaping our environment as well. So that's that's quite right because a big part of what shapes your brain is other people. It's an enormous mm. part of what shapes your brain. So yes, there is a feedback loop between um, you know when you get a bunch of brains together, they're all influencing one another and influencing the built environment and influencing what technologies are available and so on. Such that by the time you have a kid and the kid is born into the world and opens his or her eyes in, you know, 2022, they say, wow, look at this. This is all normal. Mm. Um, so that part's clearly true. I, sorry, I thought you were going to say something about, um, you know, how the, the outside world is a, is a creation of the mind or the mind causes the outside world, which is not, which is not quite correct. Oh uh, yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I haven't, I've only read a little bit about material engagement theory, but I think what you're describing is more like, um, Hoffman's book, The Case Against Reality, where he's saying that the outside world is a biological interface, something like that. I think this is a little bit different, but yeah. anyways, that's a rabbit hole we could get lost in. Um, <laughs> this next excerpt kind of ties into that though. So you wrote, quote, we are exquisitely sensitive to our surroundings because of the wire on the fly strategy of the human brain, which I'll, I'll let you describe what that is. 
who we are depends heavily on where we've been. And this reminded me of a quote by Carl Friston, where he talks about, which again, sort of related to what we were saying, that the pattern of the brain emulates the structure of the universe at the highest scales. And his quote was, the anatomy of any system has to contain within it a model of the environment in which that system is immersed. So I'm thinking here of like the microscopic image of the brain versus the macroscopic image of the the cosmos, they kind of look similar. Um, that might be a bit of a stretch, but I wonder if maybe you could just unpack um, your quote and speak to it. Sure. In, I'll, in that context. I'll, I'll unpack a few of those points. Yeah. Um, what, what Friston is referring to uh, is something I've written about at length, which is about the brain's internal model. So remember you're, you know, you've got, um, so yeah, let me unpack that uh, a few of those points. So, the key is that the brain is locked in silence and darkness, and the way it functions is it makes a model of the outside world. So I have a model of my wife and my children and the city I live in and what the maps and geography are around here and how my culture works and how my language works and how people will react when I say this or that to them. That's all a model running in my head. So if, uh, if I walk outside my house and someone comes up to me aggressively, I'm all, my brain is screaming along with predictions about, okay, here's what I do now. Here's what this might be about. Maybe he's mentally ill. Maybe he's going to try to steal my wallet. Maybe this is going to be a fight and so on. Um, and the reason I have the capacity to make predictions is because I have a model of the world. I've seen thousands of interactions between people. I've seen thousands of movies. I've read thousands of books. I have all kinds of ideas about what to do. And that, I imagine, is what Friston was referring to and what I write about, about the internal model of the outside world. Um, so there's that. Now, the point about this, you know, when you look at a photograph of the cosmos and a photograph of the brain, um, there are similarities, but I suspect that has more to do with the fact that there's just, there's only a certain number of shapes things can be. Right. And we find network properties from the very small to the very large, which doesn't mean they're you know, it's the same thing going on. It's not like it's a fractal universe necessarily. It just means, okay, there's only a certain number of patterns you're going to find. And so sometimes photographs can look um, similar to one another. But, but yes, the main thing is that we are absorbing the world around us and that is what shapes us to be who we are. And so, you know, we all have this notion of, um, you know, oh, that, that guy that we like, he's, a, he's his own man. He's an independent thinker. Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably no such thing as that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we admire certain qualities in people that strike us in that way. But the fact is, um, had that same exact string of DNA been born a thousand years ago, he'd be a completely different person, speaking a different language, believing in different gods, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I've often taken issue with that myself, the idea of a self-made man. Because even if you're, you know, usually that implies someone that is, uh, became wealthy in their life, you know, went from rags to riches, something like that. But the very, the very capacity to attain riches is dependent on the market, right? Which is dependent on everyone else. So it's like, it doesn't actually exist. Even, you, even though you can have those qualities, you're not in the strict sense, a self-made person ever. <laughs> That's exactly right. Because that person benefited from everything his parents told him, whether or not they had money to give him, they educated him the right way, his friends, his culture, whatever, all those things fed into uh, what he was able to do. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll read another excerpt here. And I thought this, this is perhaps a good one to resolve a lot of um, relationship disputes. So you're right. Quote, our past is not a faithful record. Instead, it's a reconstruction, and sometimes it can border on mythology. When we review our life memories, we should do so with the awareness that not all the details are accurate. Some came from stories that people told us about ourselves. Others were filled in with what we thought must have happened. So if your answer to who you are is based simply on your memories, that makes your identity something of a strange, ongoing, mutable narrative. Yeah. So that's interesting because right. I'm just reflecting on arguments I've had with past girlfriends and it's, you said this, no, I said this. And 
in reality, <laughs> memory is not a faithful record. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not a faithful record where, you know, memory is a myth making machine and we constantly reinvent our past to keep it consistent with who we think we are. And, um, yeah. And when, you know, when we talk about what we said, what she said in our year, what we said, it's, um, it, you know, it's not only the issue of bad memory. It's that in the moment, even what we interpret, let's imagine your girlfriend says something to you, how you interpret it and how someone else watching it might interpret it is also going to be different. Mm -hmm. um, just because we have different experiences that we bring to the table, whether we think the person is, you know, reaching out for help or being aggressive or being, um, what, you know, whatever, it's all a matter of interpretation. This is, I think, one of the interesting things about police officers wearing cameras, being, uh, you know, mandated to wear cameras, mm -hmm. um, because the idea is, okay, is it the case that the officer felt his life was in danger because suddenly the suspect was coming at him? Well, the camera can tell you one thing, but that can't actually tell you what it was like inside the head of the officer mm. because the officer might think, okay, my life is in danger right now. And, and so a jury might watch the camera and say, well, you know, there's another way you could have looked at this, but it doesn't actually answer precisely the question that we wanted it to. Hmm. Interesting. That seems like a difficult problem to untangle there because then you can almost rely yeah. on, Whatever, you know, that's kind of the insanity plea too, right? Is there was something else going on in my head that didn't match reality. Not to say the cop was well, insane right. necessarily, but he could just say the camera didn't <laughs> capture what was going on. Yeah, and sir, I don't mean to imply anything about the cop being yeah. insane. Um, no, instead, it's that you put 20 cops in exactly the same situation, and some will think, oh, I've seen this kind of jerk before, and these, this is just bluffing. And mm -hmm. another cop will think, oh, my God, I've, I've got to take action. I'm going to lose my life here. And, and it, none of them are insane. They all have different interpretations on the world. Maybe I should back up a step, which is that, you know, because of our internal models, which comes about from every experience that you've ever had, um, we all live like on a different planet on the inside. When mm -hmm. I saw the poster for, for that movie, The Martian with Matt Damon, mm -hmm. the, the poster shows him standing alone on the red planet. And I thought, God, that's a perfect visual for what, for how I see this, which is, you know, there are things that we share and, you know, we all love listening to, let's say your podcast mm -hmm. and we love doing things, but, but the fact is we're all living on our own planet. And there are just some things that, you know, happen to fall in the same orbit. But you know, when I go into the bookstore, I always find it interesting to watch other people and see people walk in the bookstore. Some people head straight for the romance section, others head for the poetry section, others head for the historical fiction section, and others head for the horror section. And so and and that's because you know, we all have different wants and desires. Uh, there um you you can't ever expect that you'll build a bookstore and everyone will go to the same book. That'll just mm. never happen. Right. <laughs> interesting. Um, yeah, so it's almost like every one of us is an island in and unto ourselves. Yes. And, um, that's funny because yes. then we, we also have to figure out how to cooperate, how to compete, do all like deal with the, the isolation we face with one another. Um, interesting. And, so and therein is the challenge, therein is the challenge of building societies. How do yeah. you do it? How do you structure governments and so on so that you can get people to, you know, maximally cooperate, even though in any, you know, everyone complains right now about the polarization going on with, with good reason. It's a, it's a lousy time with everyone being so polarized. But, but the fact is, it's not like we can look back at a different time and say, oh yeah, back in the day, everyone agreed on everything because that's just <laughs> never happened and never will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Uh, once again, sort of segues into this next excerpt, you write, practice skills become written into the microstructure of the brain. This ability to burn programs into the structure of the brain is one of its most powerful tricks. Once etched into the cir circuitry of the brain, these skills can be run without thinking, without conscious effort. And this frees up resources, allowing the conscious me to attend to and absorb other tasks. Now, this is very interesting. Um, and I talked to cognitive scientist John Ravakey about this as well. Where he describes consciousness as the aperture that we place on novelty 
something we're trying to figure out to train ourselves to, right? To learn piano or whatever it may be. But the goal of it is to put that into procedural knowledge, I guess, where you, you almost can just do it without thinking, right? Just like when you're first driving the car, you're really focused on what you're doing and how your feet are moving and all that, but eventually you're not thinking about it at all. And this reminds me of an Al- Alfred North Whitehead quote, and he wrote that civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking about them. So therein lies really the economic value of ritualization, institutionalization, automation, all of these things that we can perform an important function without having to think about it. This is occurring, I guess, in our mind, but it also advances us as a civilization. I think it's two separate issues. So um, so Whitehead's, of course, totally right about civilization. Um, and, you know, there's... You know, look at something like a computer transistor and how you can use that to build more and more complicated circuits and so on, all the way up to building whole motherboards and so on. It's more and more and more complex. But what you get is a collapse of the complexity when you get like, you know, in the mid 90s when Google came out, suddenly it's just a blank page and a search bar and you just type in a word and you find out what everyone says about that word. So it's taking this enormous complexity and just collapsing it down. And I think that's what White head is referring to is you know the whole damn thing just becomes automated and suddenly you can search what anyone in the world has said about the topic that you're looking for and that's terrific and that is how civilization moves forward what's interesting is that in humans we think of that as expertise in something but if you gain expertise in one thing it means you can't make it in others for example um you know someone came up to the violinist Yitzhak Perlman after one of his concerts and said I would give my life to play like you do. And he said, I did. <laughs> Meaning that that's all he does. He does that every day. And as a result, you know, his brain, Perlman's brain is shaped to be a virtuoso at the violin. Um, but he can't do other things also. He can't be a stock trader and a mm-hmm. soccer player and so on. And so... Um, you know, I don't know if this counts as civilization moving forward because it's more of a different thing. It's, this is just expertise. This is how we get expertise is we um, practice things over and over and over uh, and we get better and better at them because we're burning it down into the circuitry of the brain. So it no longer becomes something we have to be conscious of, as you said. Instead, it's something that we can do in an automated fashion. When I was younger, I used to play baseball and, and the coach would say, I want you guys to think out there. And I'd say, actually, you don't want us to think out there. What you want us to do is train a sufficient number of hours so that we automatize these behaviors. And then we just go out there and perform. And that's when he knew you were going to write a book on the brain. <laughs> yes. Well, I had to do that to finally prove that to him. Yes. But so my book, my book Incognito is all about this. It's all about the unconscious brain. Uh, which drives our thoughts and our behaviors and what you believe to be true, all of this stuff that you don't have any access to because you've automatized it. And by the way, you know, before you've automatized something, it is conscious. And after that, it, you can't even access it anymore. So take riding a bicycle. When you're first learning how, you're totally conscious of, oh my gosh, which way am I leaning? And where's my foot? And how's my leg? And whatever. And, uh, and then after a while, if I asked you to describe to me how you ride a bicycle, you can't do it. Right. Because now it's too deep into the system. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I've, I mean, again, I can't help but because in a, a, a state of nature where we're all cavemen, right? We're all just fighting to survive for our next meal and place to sleep and what have you. There's not enough accumulated wealth or capital for someone to specialize in something like the violin. So it's it just seems like there might be an, a similar at least economic dynamic, like the, the, the biology of the brain is trying to economize. It sounds like by doing this, right. Etching these patterns under the brain that it can, uh, automate, I think. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. Um, as I mean, what's really special about the human brain is that we have the capacity to absorb our environment which is unlike, you know, I mean, other animals can do this too, but not nearly to the extent we can. So like my dog, I can teach some tricks too, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. But, But humans, there's a lot of things that 
came out of the massive expansion of the human brain, even though it's made of all the same stuff that my dog's brain is, we have a bigger cortex, which is the outer wrinkly bit on the outside. And um, the key about that is it allows us to simulate what ifs. It allows us to say, okay, well, wait, what if I did this? What if I did that? And I don't have to try everything. I can let my hypotheses die instead of me. Mm. And so by, by doing this, by having this capacity to simulate things and try it, we were able to find the efficiencies that, you know, that Whitehead is referring to, where we could then automatize structures there. And hey, here's how we farm foods. So we have plenty of food. And don't worry about it. Here's how we store it and so on. And then exactly as you say, then uh, division of labor was able to really mm -hmm. blossom. And once we got division of labor, then we're able to do all kinds of stuff because then you have, for example, I live in Silicon Valley and you have all these people here who devote their lives to building some little motherboard transistor mm -hmm. great thing, which then makes everyone else's life easier. Like most of the companies around here are doing things that will affect the lives, hopefully in a good way of billions of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's division of labor at its finest. Yeah. That's very interesting. Uh, this is just a question that popped into my mind, but I don't know because in humans past those learnings, I mean, clearly we pass them through literature and, uh, you know, formal education, but we're also passing a lot of this through uh, mimicry and mimesis, right? That we, we imitate one another a lot. And this is clearly from parents to children is a primary um, vector for this. But how important is that in this whole process? Like we're learning to do these new skills and figure things out. And then we're passing that forward generationally. How much does that weigh into this process? Yeah, it's massively important. It's um, you, your, your intuition is exactly right about this. We watch other people. By the time you become a young teenager, your whole life is about your peers. I mean, mm. at the beginning, you're absorbing tons of stuff from your parents, and you probably do things when you react in a certain way or sign a certain way, and you think, oh, God, that's just like my dad, and so yeah. on. And, and when you have kids, they'll do the same thing, and you'll see them, and you'll think, damn it, they picked that up for me, the way, yeah. I, the way I speak when I'm angry or something. Yeah. So we do lots from our parents, but by the time you're, whatever, 11, 12, it's all about your peers. But um, you're exactly right. This is how we learn about the world. And so much of the structure of the human brain Traditionally, we've studied as, okay, here's how you see and here's how you reach and here's how you make a decision. But what went ignored in all that is all the circuitry in your brain that's about other people, that's about simulating other people. So essentially, everybody in your life that you know, you probably know about a thousand people, um, you've got pretty rich simulations of all of them and especially the people you're closest with. So your partner and so on, your parents, I mean, you're running really rich simulations and all that requires brain real estate. I mean, you're actually running whole chunks of your brain on other people. Wow. And the fact that you can store a thousand people in there or maybe many more, like if you're a presidential candidate, you probably have, you know, 10,000 people and 50,000 people. That's pretty extraordinary. Wow. So interesting. And then. It's almost like a uh, reality simulator or video game generator or something like that. Because then when we're thinking, right, we're then taking a few of those avatars that are relevant to a certain situation and walking forward. What happens if I do A or B or C? So that's so that's interesting. exactly right. That's exactly right. And we spend most of our time, by the way, most of our lives... We are not in the here and now, but we are simulating possibilities or reminiscing. Mm. Um, and by the way, the reason we have memory, the reason we write anything down is so that we can make better predictions about the future. But, but yeah, anyway, you know, philosophers talk about or, you know, you know, religious figures talk about being in the here and now and the importance of that. The fact is that's totally impossible for the brain. The brain's not, not built to do that and probably will never be particularly good at doing that because what it is good at doing is running these simulations. That's why meditation is so hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. 
As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. All right, I'll read another excerpt here. Um, you wrote, the conscious mind excels at telling itself the narrative of being in control. Your brain is like a neural parliament composed of rival political parties, which fight it out to steer the ship of state. I just think that's so interesting that because you almost hear that wrestling in your mind often, often, especially with difficult decisions, right? You're like you're feeling pulled one way, but also pulled another. Um, yeah. I keep coming back to this kind of fractal reflection thing, but is that why we put government together that way? Is it like we put together parliaments as somewhat of a yeah. reflection of our brain? Okay, great. So, so right. So let me cover these one at a time. So yes, in, in my book Incognito, I talked about, I, I built this framework of the brain, brain as a team of rivals. Hmm. And um, yes, yeah, so exactly as you said, you've got all these different drives that are constantly trying to steer your behavior. And what you do at any given moment is a matter of which way the parliament votes and how that goes. And at different times, you'll do different things. So, you know, sometimes you see a chocolate chip cookie on the counter and you're going to eat it and other times you won't. But what you have are all these voices. One of them says, hey, that's a rich energy source. You should eat that cookie, Robert. And another voice says, don't eat it, you'll get fat. And another voice says, okay, I'll eat it, but I'll go to the gym tonight or whatever. And you can cuss at yourself. You can cajole yourself. You can contract with yourself. And the question is, who's talking with whom here? It's all, it's all you, but it's different parts of you. Now, the relationship to government is interesting because it's only extremely recently that that has been implemented as a form of government. So um, the, the place where I got the, the term team of rivals was from Abraham Lincoln, who built his cabinet to be a team of rivals. But he was, at least in American politics, the first person to say, hey, I'm actually going to take people who disagree with me and put them all in the same room. Hmm. Um, nobody else does that. Not Trump, not Biden. No one likes to do that generally. And... Um, and, you know, most of the other governments around the world also don't take advantage of that. Um, the, the one thing that has come up that's very useful in many governments, though, is at least having a two-party system or, or multiple-party system. And, you know, as much as everybody gripes about that here, thank God we have a two-party system um, because that's what you always want is, you know, the tension between uh, different points of view. Um, the, the last thing you want is to have one party in power, in total power. And mm -hmm. we've seen that happen time and again, whether that's Nazi Germany or communist China or, um, you know, communist Russia or any place, right or left wing. It's a terrible idea when you have one party in power. Absolutely agree with that. Uh, we talk a lot about the history of the state on this show and it never ends well. Once again, this is a good segue <laughs> to the next excerpt and question I have, you write, when making life and death decisions, unchecked reason can be dangerous. Our emotions are powerful and often insightful, are a powerful and often insightful constituency. And we'd be remiss to exclude them from the parliamentary voting. So this is perhaps the danger of centralizing state power, because in the decision makers become so divorced from the consequences of their decision, right? Instead, Nassim Taleb writes about this, where at a certain scale of society, it goes, we go from having interpersonal relationships to people just being rows on a spreadsheet kind of thing. So it's a lot easier to dehumanize and, you know, do whatever to rows on a spreadsheet. Um, how, I mean, how can we, how do we scale society, but also keep this emotional check on, um, the tyranny of reason. Yeah, it's such a great question because that 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 is the question. But I totally agree with your intuition about centralized government. 
This is what happened, for example, with Lyshenkoism in the USSR, uh, where you mean know, Lyshenko was a um, you know agricultural figure who was taken on by the government to say, okay, look, we're just going to make a standardized way of of growing crops in the USSR across all the time zones, mm. and that was the worst idea, which is a big part of what actually led to the fall of communism in Russia, uh, in the USSR, is because things went so badly with that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, because you had, you had s control that was too centralized, and the local farmers in these different climates and zones knew better how to run their crops, but they were forced to do it all in this one way. So the way we do it in the United States, I think, is at least a, a better way of trying to hope for the, for the best here, which is... Um, you know, we have a, a central government, but we also have states. We have essentially 50 different Petri dishes that are running their own experiments. And within that, we have counties. And um, and so everyone gets to try out different ways of doing things. And I th that's a terrific idea. And so people who want to give more and more power to a single centralized government, there are a lot of problems with that. But one of them is the one that you're pointing to also, which is... You just can't, as a central government, you, you can't care that much about the lines on the spreadsheet. Whereas if it's the people, the constituents of your county, and you grew up with that guy and that girl over there you had a crush on in the third grade and so on, and those neighbors you remember from when you were a kid and so on, it makes a big difference. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And I know in your book you highlighted, too, the danger of like remote drone weaponry and things like that where people – can be much more indiscriminate in their killing when it's you're playing a video game effectively versus being live. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And there's a lot of there's a lot of good research on this issue about empathy, which is that yeah, if I you know if I see somebody right in front of me, I'll have a completely different sense of empathy than I do if it's just yeah, if it's just a video game. I mean, there's an economist who asks the following question, which is. So let's say I ask this to you, Robert, which is, you know, um, imagine you buy a sandwich at the sandwich shop and you sit down and you're just about to enjoy your sandwich and you notice a starving child sitting right outside the sandwich shop. Would you give your sandwich to the starving child? So what's your answer? Yes or no? The devil's always in the details, but the way that's phrased, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Yeah, almost certainly. I think all of us would. But it turns out that right now there are starving children all over the world. And all you would have to do is go online and click and you could donate 10 bucks to some kid in, you know, on the other side of the world. But but you're not doing that. Why? Well, it's because, you know, when something is right in front of our face, it's much more salient than if we're mm. simply uh, thinking about it, imagining it. Yeah, that's a great point. Um yeah, again, that was something Verveke touched on a lot with this idea of salience landscape and um, very, it, it's very relevant to all of our actions, but it can also become distorted in our modern systems. Um, sorry, I'll read another excerpt here. And now you may have noticed I keep trying to tie things together. So forgive me if the analogy is right. off, but I'll ask. You write <laughs> that prediction error signal allows the rest of the brain to adjust its expectations to try to be closer to reality next time. This is in regards to dopamine. The dopamine acts as an error corrector, a chemical appraiser that always works to make your appraisals as updated as they can be. So the way I conceive of the global marketplace is really as the mind of minds, if you will, right? We're all allocating scarce resources, hopefully according to the uh, demand configurations of the world. It's not always based on demand. Sometimes it's based on force versus, you know, supply and demand. Um, but so my question in there is in, in, in the economic system, we use money to denominate prices and prices function as like the nerve signal of the economy. So if there's, you know, the classic example, if there's an earthquake in Chile in a copper mine, something in the copper production goes down, well, all of a sudden uh, supply of copper tanks, demand is the same. So the price goes up. This is a signal to every copper producer in the world to produce more copper. And it's a signal to every buyer of copper in the world to use less or, you know, um, to curb basically consumption of copper. 
So without having to tell anyone about the earthquake at all, so you just propagated this signal in a very efficient way. So what I'm trying to get to is what is the equivalent in the mind? Is it, you described dopamine as an error corrector. Is dopamine like the medium of exchange within the brain or is there some other mechanism for that? Interesting question. No. Um, so there are many, many ways that information is carried in the brain. And what you just described in the example of the copper mine is more like um, any of the feedback loops in the brain. So for example, if I'm hungry and I eat, certain hormones are released, they go through my bloodstream, that changes my behavior. I'm now no longer seeking food, I'm doing something else. We have a million flavors of these feedback loops that navigate our behavior. So, you know, in the case of the copper mine, um, you know, there's a feedback loop with the supply and demand and everything settles to where it's supposed to be. Um, dopamine, in contrast, though, is about um, what's called a prediction error, which simply means I have a prediction about something and sometimes things turn out to be better than expected or worse than expected. And that's when dopamine comes online to tell you that. So, you, you know, in this internal model that you have, where you're making predictions about the world all the time, I think, oh, I know exactly what's behind this door, and I know exactly what it'll be like if I go to the, this coffee shop, and if I order this off the menu, and so on. But, but sometimes what happens is I order that thing off the menu, and it was way better than I expected. So I get a burst of dopamine that, make that, that corrects my error in the judgment. So I think, okay, great. Now I expect it to be really good. And if next time I go and it's really terrible, then I have a, a negative dopamine signal, which tells me, oh, no, okay, it should be worse. But, but by this way, this is essentially how I improve my internal model all the time. I'm walking around saying, okay, look, I got it. I got the whole world. I know exactly what's up. But in fact, you never know exactly what's up and things always turn out better or worse than you expected. And so that's how you update it. Interesting. So that to tie this back to like an economic analogy, that sounds to me more like the entrepreneur. Actually, entrepreneurs are trying to map their present action onto anticipated future market data structures. So they're basically trying to you know be where the proverbial puck is going kind of thing. But profit and loss is that error correction. It's like they may try to create something they think people want. No one buys it, right? The cost of their inputs exceed their output. That's a huge loss. So oh, that's an error correction. I'm going to reduce selling that. Or the flip is they make a huge profit. This signals to other entrepreneurs to come and do the same thing, to come and compete. So is that more like a dopamine analogy? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's using feedback from the world to say, whoops, I had a prediction. It wasn't exactly right. Here's how I'm going to fix that prediction. Here, I'm going to nudge it up. I'm going to nudge it down. Yeah, exactly. And you're exactly right. The economy, this is what happens all the time. That's so cool. I wonder if we'll ever get to some kind of theory that ties these things together. If there's like a, I don't know what it would be, a physics pattern theory, something. <laughs> you know, I've, I've wondered about this too. I, I suspect that, you know, um, at different levels of complexity, you have the same thing happening because really what this all has to do with is just feedback loops. Mm -hmm. And so, you might have feedback loops, but there's, there's not going to be the exact equivalent to dopamine. There won't be something where we say, hey, dopamine mm -hmm. equals, you know, the Fed or whatever. Right, right. It's just, but it'll be similarities in, oh, you know what? When you realize this is better than you thought, then you're going to spend more time doing that. Or you'll manufacture more of this product because you realize the, the, the demand is larger. Right, right. So yeah, I've read a little bit about systems theory. They talk a lot about stocks and flows and feedback loops. And it sounds like maybe that could be the language to discuss, to explore think, these different domains through. I think that's right. I think that's exactly right. And, and you know, the systems theory language in a sense is quite boring, mm -hmm. um, but but I think it is the right language. The The, the difficulty is... What you have in that is, okay, look, here's a simple feedback, you know, like the thermostat on my wall, I turn it up, the thing goes up, oh, mm -hmm. now it, you know, it hits that, so it stops and so on. And then as you add more and more levels of complexity, like, okay, let's say there's a nested feedback loop inside of this one, or this one goes and talks to nodes two and three, and then two talks to three, but three talks to four and whatever. Mm -hmm. Soon as it starts getting even the least bit complex, our poor human brains are just not meant to take on 
systems like that. So we can right. simulate that on computers, but it's very difficult to intuit them. Yeah, that combinatorial explosion just become, and even for computers, it becomes impossible at some point. If you look at something like the weather, right? We still haven't cracked that one. We've done better, but we can't predict weather long term. That's right. Although that's for a slightly different reason. That's because you have to take into account like all the cells of air across the entire planet. So it's just, it's a huge problem. And in mm. theory, if we knew the position of every molecule around the planet, we would be able to do it just fine. It just yeah. turns out to be a very big complex system. Gotcha. You bet. So this is in regard to a Ulysses contract, which comes out, the definition of which comes out in the excerpt here. So you write, quote, Ulysses knew that his future self would be in no position to make good decisions. So the Ulysses of sound mind arranged things so that he couldn't do the wrong thing. This sort of deal between your present and future self is known as a Ulysses contract. People structure things in the present so that their future selves can't misbehave. The key to the Ulysses contract is recognizing that we are different people in different contexts. To make better decisions, it's important not only to know yourself, but all of yourselves. So this is really interesting to me because this ties directly into the Austrian economic concept of time preference, where... Um, in a nutshell, the lower your time preference, the more long-term thinking you are. So the more of those future selves you're considering with any present decision. And this is very closely related to like the natural interest rate and other incentives. Um, but I thought, you know, and this show, we talk about Bitcoin often. We consider Bitcoin to be um, kind of the, the ultimate monetary technology, if you will. But I want I don't know how much you know about Bitcoin, if you want to talk about it, but I just wanted to throw this out there that it seems like perhaps Bitcoin could be viewed as one of these ultimate Ulysses contracts because it's we've set a money in place that no one can change. Now, one of the main problems in the world, as you may be noticing recently, is inflation. All right, historically, governments will inflate money supplies until they destroy the money. The money loses all meaning. And when you break that base level protocol, civilization collapses, right? This is, we've seen this time and time again. Well, finally in Bitcoin, we have a money nobody can inflate. So it's almost like that. I'm kind of reminded of um, who's the guy that tied himself to the mast to protect himself Ulysses. from the sirens? It was Ulysses. Okay. Yeah, that's Ulysses. Yeah. Right, so there we go. Uh, <laughs> so could, yeah. is that a useful framing for something like uninflatable money? I'm, you know, that's interesting. So, so let me, let me just say what the Ulysses contract is, and then we'll figure out if it's a useful framing. You know, the Ulysses contract is essentially you are, you know, you, let's say you want to go to the gym or you don't want to drink alcohol anymore. Um, but so you can, in this moment, say, great, I'm full of vim and vigor. I got this covered. But <clears throat> when you get really smart, or wise about things, you'll realize, gosh, you know, the Robert of a, uh, a festive Friday night or a lonely Sunday night might end up drinking. And, you know, the Robert of a lazy Wednesday might not go to the gym and so on. So you start to understand your future selves better. And what you're trying to do in Ulysses contract is bind your future behavior so that you can't do the wrong thing. So in the case of alcoholism, for example, in <clears throat> Alcoholics Anonymous, the first thing you're told to do is clear all the alcohol out of your home because, you know, that way you won't be tempted to drink it. So when you're full of the resolution, then you clean it out of your home. With the gym, you know, you set up a social contract to go with your friend to the gym so that when that Wednesday comes around, you're like, dang it, I really don't want to go, but I told Fred I would be there, so you have to go. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways that we make contracts with ourselves to bind our future behavior. And, uh, and governments do this sort of thing too when they say, look, we're going to withdraw from this country at this date or something like that, you know, they're, they're trying to protect themselves from the, the winds of political change by, by, by putting a flag in the sand and saying, look, this is when we're going to do something. Now, I'm not sure if Bitcoin falls into this category. It is a different structure of technology, uh, you know, of a money system, but it's not really like saying, I'm going to do this such that I don't do that. I, I can give you a financial example of Ulysses' contract, though, which is 
in, in 1909, um, this banker named Merkel Landis came up with this idea of a Christmas club. And he said, um, he said, look, he worked for a bank and he said, I wonder if we could get people to give us their money all year and then we'll invest that money and make money off of that. And then at the end of the year, we'll give them their money back, their capital back. And so he called this a Christmas club and he said, look, you, you'll actually get fined if you take your money out early. And so it's, it's the stupidest thing you can imagine from a financial point of view. No economist would say you should give up your own money because you could invest your own money in something. But it turns out it was a huge success because people willingly give up their money. Why? Because they're getting Ulysses' contract out of it. Because they know that if given the chance, they'll end up blowing all their money before the holidays when they need to buy gifts for people and so on. So it's a way of saying, look, bank, you hold on to my money for me and I'm not going to spend it. And then at the end of the year, you give it back to me. And people actually like this sort of Ulysses contract, even though it's economically not a sound principle. Um, uh, another example is the, the IRS. Many, many people list a number of deductions so that more money gets taken out of their paycheck so right. that come April, they get a big check from the government. They think, whoa, I'm rich. Look at this money. Well, that's stupid. You shouldn't let the government yeah. keep your money. You should invest your own money. Yes, but that's the Ulysses contract. It's actually, I, I, sorry, I shouldn't have said it's stupid. From an, from an economist's point of view, it would be, but the truth well, is, for some people, that's useful. It's an interest-free loan to the U.S. government, so economically, it is pretty stupid. <laughs> exactly, but the sense in which it's not stupid is that for some people, if they have enough insight to know, if I'm holding on to my money, I'm going to blow it. I'm not going to, yeah, I'm just going to spend it on stupid stuff. So I'd rather yeah. have the government hold, it on to, uh, hold on to it for me then it actually could make sense. But that's, that, that's what a Ulysses contract is. I guess one of, maybe another way to frame inflation is that it lets governments abdicate on those types of commitments because when there's a loss, right, they haven't um, reconciled the budget. They just print money to pay bills or to pay interest on past debt. So it never, yeah. it's, a, it's a perpetual kicking of the can or, or delay of the day of reckoning. And it's just, externalizing all that cost onto society. Like we pay for it in the form of higher prices um, and all the other, there's a lot of consequences to debasement, but. Um, oh yeah, no, I totally agree. Governments yeah. have no particular reason to make meaningful Ulysses contracts with themselves because they know they'll be out of there. Someone else will be elected. Um, and so, you know, this notion of Ulysses contract is very useful in our own lives, but yeah. governments just are simply not incentivized to check their own behavior if they can pass the buck instead. So what, maybe that's a useful structural consideration is how do we get those contracts at the government level? <laughs> then they'd make, yeah, they'd at least have an incentive to make good on some of their stated political commitments. Yeah. One last excerpt. I know we're almost out of time here, but I wanted the end of your book gets extremely interesting, so I could not pass this up. You write, quote, we could exist digitally by running ourselves as a simulation, escaping the biological wetware from which we've arisen, becoming non-biological beings. That would be the single most significant leap in the history of our species, launching us into the era of transhumanism. Tell me more about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, when we look at the brain, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's extraordinarily complex, but fundamentally it's pieces and parts. It's cells. It's 86 billion of these cells hooked together in very complex uh, circuitry. But if it's just pieces and parts, then we should be able to reproduce it out of silicon, out of beer cans and tennis balls, out of whatever you want, you should be able to build, let's say, you know, a, a model of your brain um, out of other materials. And then, then you don't have to die in, unless you want to. But you, um, you know, I could say, hey, Robert, how are you doing in there? Are you feeling okay? You say, oh, I'm feeling a little hungry, whatever. But it's, it's you because we are the sum total of all this activity in our brains. Um, and so that's why it's possible. Now, unfortunately, it's not going to happen in our lifetimes. This is, if I had a hazard, a completely arbitrary guess, I'd say, you know, maybe 300 years from now mm. is when we'll have the technology sufficient to actually scan and copy your brain in that level of detail and then reproduce it. In fact, just to get the structure of your brain all in one place would be a zettabyte of data, which is about a quarter of the computational capacity of the planet right now. So it's an wow. enormously... 
expensive thing to try to, to do that. But, you know, 300 years from now, I think it'll be a piece of cake. And at that point, people won't die. So we're sort of of the last era where people will, will uh, you know, live some number of decades and then be gone. Wow. So uh, a couple of questions and I'll let you go. That would make us some kind of like an evolutionary phase, I suppose. And then ontologically, exactly. what does that mean? We become like a cloud of intelligence in the universe or something? <laughs> I, I, so one possibility is that it is no different to be a simulation. So once you're in a computer and running in a computer simulation, um, it would feel exactly like this. And of course, this is what has led many philosophers to say, maybe we already are simulations because how would, how would we know? Right. And it doesn't matter, right? I mean, if you, if you think and you love and you enjoy and you fear and you whatever, like then that's, there it is. It doesn't matter if you're a simulation or not. So um, yeah, we might, we might already be there, but yes, what you're saying is accurate, which is that we as, as meat robots might just be an intermediate stage that is there to light the spark of, um, you know, more robust materials that then live on forever and, you know, spread throughout the galaxy. Wow. Mind, mind blowing stuff. David, I have to thank you again for writing this book. Uh, it's just been, uh, brain expanding, I guess I would say if you would great, if you would not mind, please letting my audience know where they can find out more about you or your work. Yeah. Um, so my website is eagleman.com. And, uh, or you could see my Stanford webpage or things like that. Also, I run a company called Neo Sensory where we build uh, the hardware. It's a wristband to pass information into the brain. Hmm. Um, and so, I, yep, I'm easy to find online. And I, my, my latest book is called Live Wired. It's about brain plasticity. And actually, I'm happy to report that got nominated for the Pulitzer Prize, um, but didn't win, but got nominated. So. <laughs> That's a good nomination to have, nonetheless. Yeah. David, thanks so much for coming on. Great. Thank you so much, Robert. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah.